Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on the ice on ASTV. We've been talking around North America with regards to some of the leagues that have been able to actually put hockey on ice as well as just working on camps. One of those leagues that decided to go dormant this 2020-21 season was the Western States Hockey League, and for good reason. I mean, we always want to see hockey being played on the ice, and we want to see players having that opportunity to make it to their next level. Unfortunately, Commissioner and President Ron White, along with the executive directors, decided to pull the plug on this year. But that does not mean that the WSHL will be coming back uh, weaker. Rather, they'll be much stronger than ever, uh, this hopefully, this upcoming fall. So I have a chance right now to speak with Ron White, President and Commissioner of the WSHL here on the ice. Joining me, President Commissioner Ron White. Ron, it's been, I got to say, almost 15 years since the last time I actually saw you in Long Beach, California. <laughs> it's been a while. It's it has been a, been a while. You're looking great. You're doing fantastic, I hope, in uh, Southern Calisto. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm in Orange County. I, I think uh, you saw me at uh, one of the rinks I operated. It would have been Lakewood Rink, not the one in Anaheim, but the one in Long Beach, perhaps. And Yeah. I think I was watching some of the Bombers and some of the, the Valencia games back in the day when I was still coaching midget hockey in Southern California. Man, those are some great days. Yep, yep. It's uh, grown a lot since then even. Absolutely. There's got to be, now talking about that, there has to be a tremendous influx of more amateur sports hockey players, you know, U16, U18s over the last decade just because of the increase of the NHL along the southern west coast yeah the, the 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 growth started oh you know the initial growth started with gretzky and then it plateaued probably 10 years into that and the ducks started in uh, 94 their first season they they grew the sport in southern california quite a bit and the san jose sharks up in northern california and then around we started getting our first, um, let's say, age outs from midgets and going into juniors in probably around 2000, or excuse me, about uh, 1998, I guess it was. Uh, and by 2001, we, had, uh, we started a regular development and delivery into college uh, Division One hockey. And it's grown since. I mean, I remember working then. with USA development teams under U17, U18 programs and their feeder system that now is currently in the, the USHL actually having a USA uh, team hockey 17 team. So that's been a tremendous feat working with those kids and having those kids together for an entire season playing. Now, we talked a little bit off air with regards to the last season, the 2019-20 how heartbreaking it was it to get that news in the middle of March and how hard was it to really, you know, take a grasp of what was happening outside hockey? Well, we probably were more exposed and earlier in the thought process regarding COVID-19 and how it was going to affect um, us and, and other, you know, sports uh, uh, enterprises. Um, we going into the second weekend of March was our first round of playoffs, and we literally had two teams on a Thursday night. I was on. I was sitting in the Las Vegas airport on my way to Alberta to uh, you know watch the playoffs uh, going on there, uh, and. I was sitting in the uh, one of the lounges, and on the sports came on that the NBA, or no, excuse me, that Trump had closed the borders uh, between Canada and the U.S. And I literally was within you know minutes of getting on a plane and going there. And had the plane not been late, I would have been in the air and stuck in Canada for God knows how long. Um, 
not that that would have been bad other than the fact that, you know, I, I don't live there. Um, so uh, uh, I immediately canceled plans to go and called our executive committee. At the same point, we had two teams loading on buses in Seattle to drive to Utah for the first round of playoffs. Now, we had earlier in the day, because of the major outbreak of COVID-19 in Seattle, we had canceled those two teams from being able to travel to Utah. Because at that point in time, Seattle was sort of the hotbed in the United States of COVID-19. And one of the coaches of one of the Seattle teams, wife was a, uh, a uh, supervising nurse at the hospital where the first five people died. And she had come home not feeling well, which means conceivably at that point, we're thinking that she might have it. And if she might have it, her husband might have it. And therefore being on a, on a bus for 12 hours going to Salt Lake probably wasn't the smartest thing for 25 players. So we, we canceled both, both teams from going to playoffs, which um, I might add brought a lot of uh, uh, not, not so pleasurable emails and uh, postings on websites and so on. But uh, not only was it the smartest thing we did, it was the right thing to do at that time um, because of COVID in Seattle. And at that point in time, Utah might have had a little, but not, you know, not much. Um, and then within a week of that, uh, no, actually, within by uh, by Friday at noon, the N the NBA had canceled their season as it stood, and we canceled ours about. 10 minutes after they did. We didn't even know they had done it yet because we were on a conference call and we canceled ours just because of the, just, you know, being on the West Coast, we had, you know, a lot of teams in places where there was a lot of COVID at that point in time and not so much COVID in other parts of our footprint. So we canceled it at that point, ended the season, um, waited for about a month watching things and the the uh, initial uh, stay at home orders came out rinks closed and, and obviously i'm fairly uh, in tune as most uh, commissioners would be with what the ice rinks are doing and so on and so forth and here in california and the west coast they all closed down tighter than a drum and we decided that we thought it was going to be a long a longer term thing than what other people thought, uh, and we just couldn't see going through all the effort to bring players into a season that uh, likely wouldn't wouldn't happen, or if it did happen, it might get canceled. We'd be stuck with players in billet homes and responsible for the spreading of the disease. And most importantly, this league, our league, is 30% international players. The last thing we wanted to have done was have kids from all over the world stuck in the United States when there was a major shutdown and you couldn't get home. And a very, a very responsible decision, I think, made at the time. And, you know, we, us living in right smack dab in the middle of North America, we don't really recognize how crazy and how critical those decisions were early on in March and April on the West Coast, considering how much international travel does exist between that West Coast border and Asia. Ron, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about that decision of making sure players were safe at the end of last year, but also for this year, being the season dormant. We'll be right back here on the ice. Okay.
back with Ron White on the ice, president, commissioner of the WSHL. Ron, you made that quick decision, the critical decisions made. Talk to us what happened in this offseason and that ultimate, you know, call by the executive group and yourself to remain dormant this year. Well, we uh, initially, uh, when we made the decision to terminate last season, the first thing we got on was getting everybody home safe and sound, uh, get them out of the billet homes, get, keep them safe and sound. We got that done. Um, the long and the short of it, one player that was from Russia on his way home caught COVID in an airport somewhere and, uh, you know, ended up back in Russia with, with COVID. Uh, but not a, but because he was young, it wasn't a serious case. It was, in fact, uh, his parents reported that it really wasn't uh, maybe as bad as just the normal flu or whatever. Uh, we moved into to May and, you know, made that decision to sit on the sidelines for the 2020, 21 season. Uh, probably the smartest decision that the league has ever made in its 27 years of existence because I truly uh, believe that there's probably not one one team owner in junior hockey in North America that would sit and say that the season that they are in the middle of or completing was a good one. Um, and probably not many players can say it was a good one or many families that you know, paid the money for kids to travel, to go play, pay tuition, you know, all of that kind of thing. I think a lot of, a lot of people with, you know, significant expectations going into May, June, July, trying out, all that type of thing. Uh, most of those expectations never came about. It, I mean, you talk about the, sev the severity of this decision, but for the safety and the players, like you said, you have players all over the world, like Sweden, Finland, Russia, Canada. I mean, the, the there really isn't an opportunity to make a contingency plan during this pandemic should there be a season at all. I mean, you, it would have been unfair to the players and also unfair to the teams to have that type of responsibility considering what was going on. Correct. I mean, when you advertise a tryout time that you're going to have a 50 – one game season, plus playoffs, uh, a showcase in Las Vegas uh, that, you know, 130 college coaches will come to and so on and so forth, and you don't deliver on that, um, that has a lasting effect for a lot of years in the future. And that was one of the things that we didn't want to do. We didn't want to burn ourselves long-term for making some short-term decision that, that – uh, you know, really none of us could get behind. 51 game season. That's almost four. That's over 400 regular season games for the entire WSHL. There's, I think there's four divisions, including a 14 provincial division. Right. How was, I mean, talk to me a bit about the 2019 season and how that was operating pre COVID and how excited it was to see these players getting an opportunity to, you know, play a great style of tier two hockey. It, I mean, it, uh, given this, the skill set of a lot of the players that we bring in, the European players and so on, has upped the level of play in the league dramatically to the point where, um, at least in my opinion, our, our top eight, nine teams are, are solid tier two quality teams. Um, uh, and to now inter have interrupted that uh, progress, uh, that's probably the only negative of us making the decision we, we did, is how quickly can we get back to that point? Now, I think, personally, uh, having been in the business quite some time, been around it uh, the whole bit, uh, I believe because of the decision we made, which ends up being the smartest decision, we will have a stronger recruiting base this year than we would, we've ever had. From better players, 
players that got burned this year or at least didn't didn't see the season come about the way they thought it would or the way it was promoted to them, uh, so on and so forth. I think we'll, we will have a fantastic year of recruiting players. We, we always talk to Tier 1, Tier 2 programs north and south of the border on the importance of exposure, but also the importance of elevating that player to the next level once they do age out. How, I mean, there's got to be some great, you know, heartstring stories that involve players in the WSHL making it to the next level, whether it be college, whether it be another junior league. Ron, what have you seen in the success of these players, you know, looking at their play uh, with a team in the WSHL like Valencia, for example, and then moving on to, you know, that next level hockey what does that do for you personally to hear those stories, but also to see those players excel to further on their dreams of playing a sport they love? Well, I think it, I think that uh, we have done an excellent job over the last five to six years of expanding that development and moving the players into college and also minor league pro. Um, a lot of the international players we we bring in, they do go, they, a lot of them stay and go to college in the U.S., but many of them, because there's not necessarily college hockey in the country they're from, they go back and play minor pro in their country or a, another country. But seeing kids do that and have that ability, that's something that didn't exist in the West Coast, you know, up until where, where a lot of kids were going, up until 20 years ago, and certainly – over the last 10 years, it has grown dramatically from that. I mean, I know in my own case, I have a son that played Division One college hockey, and quite frankly, he spent eight years away from home by the time he graduated from college. Four years in a prep school and four years in college. And, you know, um, a lot of money was spent on airlines going to and from to watch hockey, you know. I, I I know the I've seen those expenses. I know what they're like. Absolutely, Ron. It's it's great. Those stories are great to hear. I want to ask you one question about the age of the player. I mean, we're dealing with players that are not 15. I mean, you get those rare 16, 17 year olds that'll play. But what do you see in you know? You take a 15 year old player, that maturity, that honing of the skills, that precision of their play when they get later on at 18 and 19, why is that such an attractive year for potential scouts? Like you mentioned in the showcase in Las Vegas, which is an amazing set of hockey. I mean, it's a hotbed for a good period of time. It's what, that showcase is a week long, almost a week and a half long. Yeah, it's, it's, it's four days, four days, a, well, five days of games. Right. You only play four games. Half the league comes in on day one and stays through day four and the other half come in on day two and stay through the fifth. So right. we can play more prime time games. And it's a, and it's a huge uh, marketing highlight for the WSHL because I've seen that operate and it is a tremendous hotbed of great talent offered for a lot of scouts to check out. What is it about looking at a player that is 18 compared to 15 that you could think of that would say, okay, this player is now ready versus worrying about a player at 16 who may have the potential. Hope, um, my phone was open here. Okay. Um, it was just, I don't even know what it was. It sounded like a doorbell. <laughs> uh, I think it was someone at my house. Um, the, uh, the, a 15 year old that can make our league is a seriously a good player. Um, small as a rule, uh, needs to develop, needs to get used to the, the, the bigger boys, the, the harder hits, et cetera, et cetera. But if they can enter the league at 15 and they're still there at 18, they're, they're good players. And they're, they're going to be watched, you know, significantly so by the top college teams because they, they want to see them early, see them over a couple of years, and then, and then put the word out to them. Uh, because our league is heavily weighted in the 19 and 20 year old, well, I should say 18, 19 and 20 year old, there's not a lot of room for 15, 16 and 17 uh, because the 18 and 19 and 20s are all 
very good players themselves. So the development is there. By the time they get to be 17 and 18, they'll be playing in more games. By the time they hit 18 and, and so on at the showcase, they're going to be the kids that are going to be being noticed the most. Absolutely. Uh, and also we've got, you know, pretty good, correct me if I'm not, I just speak for Southern California, but that U18 AAA program in SoCal is still pretty strong uh, for a good, a good group of players still, correct? Oh, it's very, it's very strong. It's, uh, you know, uh, not only is it very strong, but the, the new high school division that came about back in, I think it started in 2011 by the Ducks. That has significantly grown. I mean, huge in number of teams. And, and now um, the, uh, uh, the skill level has grown so much that they now uh, at the USA Hockey High School Nationals have won that thing a couple times in the last three or four years. Yeah, they've definitely been so, on the map, yeah. Yeah, so that that eighteen year old age bracket uh, in California is strong. Well, look at the most recent uh, World Juniors. I mean, who are the hot kids on that championship game? I think four of the really? top seven USA players were from Southern Southwest California, Southwest United States. Yeah, yeah, and most of them from Southern California. Absolutely, Ron. We're gonna take one more quick break. We're gonna talk about what your plans are these upcoming weeks to make sure the league is ready and rock and rolling for the fall of 21 here, coming up here on the ice. On the ice here with Ron White, Commissioner, President of the WSHL. Ron, you've got a pretty busy schedule upcoming here these next couple of weeks. You're planning on doing some traveling safely, I hope, to visit some of these uh, teams for next year. Yeah, the uh, uh, and typical at this time of the year. Well, it would it would be a little bit later than this because of playoffs. But uh, I leave uh, tomorrow on a on a trip that will take me up. Uh, into the northern Washington areas, uh, across uh, the U.S., stopping in uh, Detroit, uh, then over into Boston, and then finally down uh, into Florida uh, to a, uh, a major meeting. Um, so uh, our, our goal right now is solidifying our footprint. Obviously, with not playing last year, you've got some owners that uh, – um, may have gotten used to not playing or thinking that they, you know, so it's, it's taken a little bit of work to, to make sure everybody's on board. And we've had several meetings of late telephonically and obviously through zoom and so on to make sure that everybody's at the same, same, all the veteran teams are at the same spot. We are, we have a, a, a plethora of interest from new teams in new areas. Um, and that's part of what I'm going to be doing also is calling on some of them. The one negative of this particular trip is the border is still closed between Canada and Cal and U.S. and I can't get up there. So I'm doing a lot of telephoning and zooming and and so on. Uh, and we do have a uh, a league non-team over rep up there that's you know making a lot of uh, appearances and so on. And up there it's a little different. You you know you're not necessarily talking to uh, an owner first. You need to make sure you got an established arena to play in, and most of those arenas are owned by the municipalities. So it's a lot of meetings with those kind of people instead of the entrepreneur that uh, you know might end up operating the team. Absolutely. So you're 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 looking. I don't know if it's the right word is expansion, but you're looking at interests from all four corners of the United States this upcoming couple of weeks here, Ron. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So are we? I mean, did. 
are we thinking of expanding out to the east? Is that the plan, or what's what's the? Can you well, let the rabbit out of the hat before we can let the I, rabbit out of the hat? <laughs> I had a, an interesting phone call last week that has uh, precipitated a daily phone call, uh, and uh, we have been. Uh, uh, invited to come back and talk to six different potential owners that would like to put together a division back on the East Coast. Um, and I uh, will be meeting with the point person uh, when I'm passing through Boston. That's a pretty exciting step, considering that that Upper East Coast is a hotbed for not just more hockey, but the right established league and division for tier one and tier two programming. Right, right. I mean, so, it, it would be, it would certainly be logistically a good move. So that's, that's on the horizon. Let's talk about the teams that are currently in the WSHL. Uh, I mean, Valencia is the lone representative right now in Southern California, correct? Correct. So are we looking to possibly gain interest in Arizona, Nevada, is there is there an interest there for Tier 2 hockey? We have uh, interested owners in both those states. Uh, in fact, in Nevada, we have uh, uh, two ownerships interested. Um, and uh, the uh, we've got some in, uh, ownership interest in Texas, uh, two ownership interest in Utah, Okay. Um, so it's uh, we just we just signed a new uh, a new team in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Uh, a new team in oh, well, this is this is it's it's been published, but it's it's not uh, probably uh, old news. Uh, we have a new team in in Vancouver. Can it, can Vancouver, it? Washington, or Vancouver, BC. Vancouver, BC. Okay. And right across the border from Bellingham, yeah. and Fraser Valley. Um, and we're talking to some other uh, interested parties in Vancouver. That's fantastic news. I, I shouldn't say Vancouver or or the, the middle of BC. Right, okay, perfect. So, you know, the expansion is there. The interest is there. What is it for a potential player to become part of the WSHL, and why would they be considering uh, one of these teams in these divisions? Well, I think we I think we've proven – and first off, that we're a serious league and, and can advance a player to college and advance them to the minor pros if they're good enough, strong enough, big enough, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, I think we're right on par with, with most leagues. And I think one of the things that's, ha that's happened with uh, uh, Tier 2 hockey, uh, both uh, in uh, – uh, well, especially in Canada, is most of the tier two leagues now have gone to be at least partially tuition-based leagues with the with the uh, pandemic, and that's likely not going to change. So, on a on a dollar level of competition, we're we're closer than we ever were. So that attraction to international players and Canadian players to come south of the border is that still as strong as ever? Uh, certainly with the international and and we've always had good good response from the Canadian uh, areas uh, the Saskatchewan we always have a lot of players from Saskatchewan Alberta BC we don't get many from east of there but we certainly do out of those three provinces absolutely because they're directly south of where we're at I mean that's right it's geographically that's you know, fantastic. I want to remember, I remember 20 years ago, Ron, when I was still in SoCal, how attractive it was to coach and play in the States and not worry about winter weathers. That has to be one priority for a lot of these kids to get, escape some of these harsh climates. But talk about real quick how the, the transition has changed where if you were an American-born player, how exciting it was to go play in Canada. Now it's the Canadian player that is, even during this pandemic more than ever, looking forward to having a chance to play hockey next year. They may have to look south of the border, but the problem is there's so much talent already in the states that they may not be able to crack that lineup. That part's true. The you know they used to come down and be the the go-to guys. Now they come down and the go-to guys are already here, 
and uh, they have to find a way to blend in and, and find their spot. Uh, so uh, that's any, and the European kids are, are pretty much that same way. I mean, the, it's changed dramatically over the last five to six years. But, you know, when you can come to parts, you know, to Arizona, Texas, California, uh, Las Vegas, and, and play hockey, uh, and you're from, uh, you know, Sweden or Latvia or wherever, Russia, uh, it, it's it's a big attraction. It's a big attraction, and having had as many as four euros living at my house back in the day, uh, when when the bombers were playing in Long Beach, uh, and the bombers had out of a twenty five man squad had fourteen Europeans. Uh, I mean, they thought they'd died and gone to heaven about January first when it was you know forty below and wherever they were from. No doubt, were, you know, at my house swimming in the pool. Is there now? You bring up. A, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there a rule on how many imports are allowed on each team now? Right, fourteen. So that's and the number. Canadians that's the, don't count as fourteen. Okay. They count the Canadians and Mexicans because they're from North America. They count as domestic players. Okay, so then you can have almost sixty percent of your playing roster international outside of Manitoba or Canada and Mexico. So yeah, that's definitely an attraction. I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, Ron, what is a good, sorry, good luck with your travels these upcoming weeks. I know it'll be fast. It'll be furious. Stay safe and stay well. Uh, I always check out WSHL, uh, website. It's WSHL, uh, dot com. Is that correct? WSHL.org or Dot org, dot org. Right. So there'll be some uh, updates, I'm sure, coming in the next couple of months, as well as uh, the potential of expansion. Who knows? Yeah. And, and we'll be publicizing that instantly when 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 we're sure that uh, somebody's on board. Thank you very much, Ron White, for joining me here on the ice. Have a great rest of the evening for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's always been great to chat with you. It's great to see you again, like I said. And uh, do take care of yourself over the next couple of weeks while traveling and love to talk to you when we get back. All right. Thanks a lot. Ron White, Enjoy president it. and commissioner with the WSHL. Uh, he's filling us in. Make sure you check out the show on the ice Tuesday, Thursday night, seven o'clock here on ASTV. Have a great rest of the day and take care of yourselves and be safe. Bye-bye for now.